that's the pathway to our next speaker because uh, that is his major concern, uh, the uh, nexus between individual health and the planetary health that we can actually talk about today. Uh, Lasse Brun heads an organization called 50 by 40. He's going to explain about that. Uh, but Lasse, when I looked you up and I want to ask my colleagues, uh, they actually described you as somebody who's been working for many years steadfastly in the engine rooms, driving the engine of the flagship results. Uh, so that probably will make you smile a little bit, but on the website it says, and that's probably more for the audience, an advocacy specialist and leader in climate and energy, sustainable agriculture and animal rights for 20 years with deep experience in mobilization, communication, campaigning and movement building. So take us along in your movement and uh, just tell me right at the beginning, I've been a vegetarian now for the last half year, more out of consciousness than out of taste reasons. Is that the pathway that we will need to go? Well, thanks a lot for that introduction and those kind words. I, I hope I can live up to, to that uh, perspective. Um, well, your, your personal contribution by uh, cutting down on animal protein consumption is definitely uh, an, a right way to go. It helps, and we need to have a stronger connection between um, livestock, uh, between uh, consumption and production. Um, and that leads me to what I'm here to speak to uh, today, and I hope I can also provide some of the bite that was put in the introduction of me. So I'm thrilled to that the intersectionality of health, climate, and biodiversity in food systems is receiving our full attention today. Indeed, 2021, 2021 is the big year for food systems work. We've just come out of the UN Food Systems Summit after a tremendous collaborative effort over the last couple of years. And I'm happy that some of my esteemed colleagues, such as Martin Frick, Modi, Watsama, Jezayas and Ruth Richardson are here with us here today. I see them in the, the waiting room. The UN Food Systems Summit signifies a major step towards transformational change in the way we produce and consume food, and it's a launching pad for global collaboration on food systems work. I want to mention COVID-19. We witnessed uh, millions of deaths and lives forever changed at the hands of this horrendous pandemic. COVID-19 has also been a litmus test for our ability to deal with a global crisis as is it rooted in the very issues we are gathered to discuss here today and tomorrow. So the way we produce food plays a significant role in the emergence of zoonotic diseases, particularly industrial farming with livestock playing a key role, to your point. About 75% of all emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic in nature. So food production is indeed a major factor in establishing resilience. So let me turn to the issue of health following from what was stated already by Maria, for instance. Uh, and to your question, high animal-based food consumption is detrimental to human health and increases public health costs. And uh, shifting to a diet that relies less on animal products and more on fruits and vegetables could avoid, and listen to these numbers, 5.1 million diet-related deaths and dramatically reduce health costs by $735 billion per year by the year of 2050. So one outcome of the UN Food Systems Summit is the multilateral and multi-stakeholder school meals coalition, which has the aim of ensuring that every child has the opportunity to receive a healthy nutritionist meal in school by 2030. I think we can all agree we need to start there. Part of achieving that includes reducing animal protein consumption as well, particularly in the G20 countries. And it's my hope that this coalition will also address the discrepancy between what national dietary guidelines recommend and what existing policies and subsidies actually support. I'll touch on that later as well. So looking a bit on the other aspects at biodiversity protection, the livestock industry is linked to soil degradation, aquatic habitat destruction, air pollution, water contamination, and huge biodiversity losses. But some governments are starting to make some interesting steps. The Dutch government, for example, has just proposed a 30% national reduction in livestock to lower ammonia pollution. So meanwhile, grazing and feed production, as we all know, particularly in Latin America and Asia, remains the leading cause of tropical deforestation. And when it comes to the biggest issue of all, I guess, climate change, things are not looking good for livestock production either. The livestock sector accounts for at least 14.5% of all greenhouse gas emissions and is projected to account for up to 81% of the 1.5 degrees emissions budget by 2050 if production continues unabated. And the recent IPCC report adds to that dire outlook as well. 
Um, I want to take a moment to talk about the people who produce our food. It is crucial to prevent further unsustainable animal agriculture intensification and expansion in the global south, where increasing animal product consumption threatens the livelihoods of millions of smallholder farmers whose large scale producers who are outcompeted by the large scale producers who are entering the market. Specifically for job creation, we saw in 2020, the International Labor Organization and the Inter-American Development Bank estimated that a transition to more plant-based diets would create 15 million jobs net in Latin America and the Caribbean by 2030. Overall, the jobs in plant-based food production are safer, more equitable, support gender parity, and strengthen rural economies when coupled with increased public services. So as we forge ahead, there are valuable lessons we can take from the energy sector's just transition away from fossil fuels, which is going to be a big topic tomorrow. Those lessons must be applied to the food sector, especially industrialized livestock production. I call this a just livestock transition. And the just livestock transition must become a cornerstone of the UNF, uh, SS, uh, sorry, the UNFCCC member state NDCs as a major climate change mitigation and adaptation strategy. And I know Martin is probably going to touch on that link between food and the NDCs as well. And in that vein, I want to suggest adapting the common but differentiated responsibility principle to food systems. We have to work with all stakeholders and all have to take action. Um, but the onus of the responsibility lies with the G20 countries, particularly group one and four countries. So we need a rapid shift to food production based on agroecology and regenerative farming. We need to be done. I merely mean that we need to be done with the paradigm of the last century and start working with nature and not against it. And we must work with experts in circular economy, gender, human rights, work with farmers, smallholders, pastoralists, and indigenous peoples. Finally, I want to just speak briefly to the importance of financial flows. As I mentioned earlier, most nations have large, large discrepancies between dietary guidelines and subsidies. And this also applies to regions and multilateral development banks. For example, every year, the EU spends about 60 million euros of taxpayers' money to promote meat and dairy, while the European Commission is backing a shift towards more plant-based diets in its pivotal food policy, as we all know, the farm to fork strategy. We're also seeing MDBs such as the World Bank, the IMF, the EBID, and the Inter-American Development Bank supporting agricultural projects that are detrimental to the future of life on this planet. This must change. So something positive. When the World Bank divested from oil and natural gas in 2019, it was a huge step. Uh, this act sent a powerful message to all other public and private financial institutions. We need to see a similar shift within funding for destructive agricultural systems. And there is hope. I'm particularly encouraged by the launch of the Good Food Finance Network, uh, which was, uh, I have been the privilege of being part of from the onset. This initiative builds on the finance outcomes of the UN Food System Summit and is uh, developing an action agenda. The aim is to identify, deploy, and mainstream critical financial innovations to drive the transition to a healthy, sustainable food system. And to achieve that, we need a pathway that includes food, climate, and biodiversity nexus. And again, we need to see the G20 countries take the lead. So um, get, get on with it. So what are the next steps? Well, what do we recommend? All countries should develop ambitious transition roadmaps with key milestones that combine climate change, biodiversity, health, development, and crucially, food systems. Um, Johan, Johan talked about the super year of 2020, now the super year of 2021. I would like to call the next big super year, which is 2025, which will be the 10th anniversary of the Paris Agreement with just five years to meet the SDGs. This is no longer a crisis, it's an emergency, and we must take impactful, measurable action now. So let me end, like, end by saying this. Um, and I think this is really important, and I really strongly believe this. The 2020s is the decade of irreversible legacies. These are the last years we can safeguard the future for all. And I encourage all policymakers and leaders to keep that in mind. So as we are approaching Kunming, Rome, and Glasgow, please remember that every decision you make is indeed a legacy decision. Thank you so much.
Well, thank you very much, Lasse, and uh, we can only endorse uh, your last mm. words. And I love it when keynote speakers already refer to speakers that will come up later yeah. on in the program. Uh, so when you talked about Martin, you were, of course, talking about yeah. Martin Frick, uh, the deputy of the UN Secretary General, special envoy for the Food Systems Summit that has just taken place last week. And yes, food is going to be part and parcel of our panel discussion in a moment. But before I say goodbye, I just want to say you're my own personal hero. You must have gotten up something like 3.30, 4 o'clock to be as bright uh, as a button with us today. Thank you. Well, that was great. Thanks again. And, uh, you know, Connie, I think that all the keynote speech speakers gave us some incredible food for thought.